Okay, uh, welcome to introduction to photonics. Good morning. We've been uh, discussing the nonlinear response of uh, materials to electromagnetic waves. In this case, optical waves. And uh, in the previous lecture, uh, we were looking at the third order susceptibility. The one before that, we were looking at second order susceptibility. But in the last lecture, we were looking at third order susceptibility and we were uh, discussing all the possible phenomena that can happen when you have a material with relatively high third order susceptibility. Uh, there is one question as to you know when do we see a chi 2 related effects and when do we see chi 3 related effects uh, can both of those happen in the same medium. Yes, it can. Um, so, it, everything depends on uh, the relative values of chi 2 and chi 3, um, but uh, we do not have any control on uh, the uh, response itself that is the medium property. Uh, what the only thing that we can uh, provide is the electric field, um, the, the excitation, right. So, uh, we were talking about uh, four wave mixing, we are talking about uh, uh, self phase modulation through the nonlinear Kerr effect and uh, we stopped at this point where we were talking about self phase modulation in a long length of fiber. Uh, we were saying that depending upon the intensity of uh, the light, the medium responds uh, differently and uh, so it essentially ends up uh, delaying some part of the pulse with respect to others and that delay essentially is uh, it, it's, it, it produces new frequencies um, that, that were previously not present in the, uh, uh, in, in the uh, pulse spectrum. So, th these new frequencies we essentially Real, uh, call these as uh, chirp. So, uh, what that chirp also does is that the delay uh, it, it provides it is a positive slope with respect to the frequency and uh, we were discussing the aspect that this could actually be good in the sense that this could uh, potentially compensate for uh, the dispersion in a medium. And uh, so, so you could have, uh, you know, the pulse remain retaining its shape uh, as it propagates down the fiber, which would be very good for optical communication systems because uh, you don't incur these uh, dispersion-related penalties, which is actually causing uh, bit error rates in in your communication system. Um, and, and I should mention that um, there is one particular uh, shape of the pulse okay, in which the, the self phase modulation that, that it incurs and the chirp that it incurs automatically compensates for the dispersion that the pulse incurs and uh, you can remain that shape all along the length of the fiber. So, if effectively what we are saying is um, you know the propagation inside this medium is uh, controlled by what is called the nonlinear Schrodinger wave equation. So, it is just a uh, uh, nonlinear Schrodinger wave equation is it's it's just a, a modification of the regular wave equation that we've been looking at, but it it, it brings out the nonlinear aspects clearly. So if you take the nonlinear Schrodinger wave equation and you find the solution for the nonlinear Schrodinger wave equation, you find that a pulse which has actually a a secant 
square uh, secant hyperbolic square uh, sort of shape uh, is actually uh, is, is a solution for this Schrodinger wave equation which means that that shape pulse if you send it down a regular uh, single mode fiber you will actually retain that shape okay and that uh, sort of pulse is called a soliton. So, a soliton is, is essentially a solution for the nonlinear Schrodinger wave equation is such that dispersion and uh, uh, this uh, nonlinear chirp it is automatically compensated. So, it retains its shape all along its uh, the propagation and in fact uh, back in the 90s there was a lot of research on uh, soliton pulses. Uh, so, people figured if you use soliton pulses you do not have any of these uh, dispersion related penalties. So, they said ok this is the way to do communication, but of course, there were other issues with the propagation of solitons uh, when you talk about practical uh, you know things that are happening in the field there were a lot of issues with solitons and people actually gave up on that idea after a while, but that is just for your information. Um, so, what we do now in communication systems and this is what you learn if you take this fiber optic communication technology course is that you let dispersion to happen in the fiber up to say uh, some 100 kilometers and then you have a dispersion compensation element which uh, brings the shape back to it, uh, original shape pulse shape and then it is it, allowed to go further down uh, accumulate dispersion then dispersion compensation and so on. So, that is what we call as a dispersion managed system that is what is, uh, is practically implemented in uh, modern day communication systems. Okay, um, so, let us actually uh, take a look at this in a slightly deeper manner let us actually try to quantify what is the nonlinear phase that you accumulate uh, while propagating down the fiber. Okay. So, to look at that what we have to consider is uh, that nonlinear phase you have one value if you consider the power to be uniform along the length of the fiber, but we know that is not possible because the fiber does have loss. So, the power is actually exponentially decaying along the length of the fiber right. So, the if you look at the power that is uh, propagating through the fiber we know that it is going to be exponential decaying. Of course, it is not uh, probably um, you know uh, uh, very st strong exponential decay because alpha tends to be very small alpha uh, is uh, 0.2 dB per kilometer right typically for a, a communication grade single mode fiber. Nevertheless, we do have to when we are talking about the nonlinear phase that is accumulated we do have to consider the fact that the, the phase that's a, uh, that is that you have at any particular section along the fiber is dependent on the power at that particular point right. So, if you want to look at the accumulation of phase you have to integrate over all those power levels. So, this is going to be 2 pi over lambda multiplied by n 2 multi uh, divided by a and then we were just previously cover considering the power, but now you are talking about phase accumulation along the entire length of fiber. So, you say p of z d z with your uh, limit going from 0 to l where l is the total length of this fiber 
right? So that's the total phase that's accumulated. Now, of course, you say P of Z is uh, P naught multiplied by E power minus alpha Z. So you can write this as 2 pi over lambda multiplied by N2 divided by A. And uh, if you do that integral, you get P naught multiply this by this factor e power minus e power minus alpha l divided by alpha right that that's what you get when you uh, integrate e power minus alpha z okay so previously when we were uh, looking at the phase we were uh, saying 2 pi over lambda n 2 over a uh, power multiplied by length right now instead of length we are actually having this um, thing in the parenthesis so this is actually denoting an effective length right so what does that effective length mean well, physically what it means is that the power is keep it's going down over uh, a certain length. So beyond a certain length, the power is so small that the medium starts behaving linearly, right? Beyond this length, the power is so small that the medium is starting to behave linearly. So, even if you have length longer than that, there is no extra nonlinear phase that is accumulated. You understand this? Right? So, the nonlinear phase actually depends on the intensity, that is what the curve effect is. Right? And for a given um, effective area uh, for the mode, it depends on the power right if you if you're talking about a single mode fiber so and the power is decreasing along the length of the fiber so if you go to such a length that the power has decreased to let's say you know something in the order of 100 microwatts or, or lesser than that then you don't accumulate any nonlinear phase the intensity is so low that you don't accumulate any nonlinear phase you you accumulate only the phase due to uh, this n naught term you, you do not have this n 2 i term come into the picture because that is negligible compared to n naught right you understand this that is right uh, you have gone to such a long distance so if you if you want to compute what is L effective for a given fiber, right? Let us take the case of uh, your regular single mode fiber, uh, SMF 28 is, is, is a regular uh, telecom grade single mode fiber. For SMF 28, alpha is 0.2 dB per kilometer, okay? So, that is actually uh, if you want to convert it to nepers per meter how do you do that so that's 0.2 into 10 power minus 3 db per meter and if you want to convert to nepers from db to nepers you divide by 4.34 right so you can say this is 0.2 divided by 4.34 multiplied by 10 power minus 3 nepers per meter right so that is such a small value that if you consider 1 over alpha that's the term that you have over here if you have 1 over if you consider 1 over alpha that would work out to be roughly about uh, 20 kilometers 21.7 kilometers or something like that okay so 
what we are saying is it is accumulating this nonlinear phase over 20 kilometers, but beyond that the power level is so low that it does not you know have any nonlinear phase that is accumulated, right. You understand this? So, that is that is what we mean by the effective length. The physical length can be greater than 20 kilometers, but as far as figuring out the effect of uh, uh, the, the figuring out the Kerr effect, the nonlinear phase that is accumulated due to the Kerr effect, you have to take only the L effect L effective, yeah. Okay. So, let me grab this and So, what we are saying now is phi n l is, is given by this. Now, um, this can be approximated if uh, alpha l is far far greater than 1, if alpha l is far far greater than 1 or l is far far greater than 1 over alpha, right then what we find is e power minus alpha l is a negligible number, right. Then uh, you can just represent this as 2 pi over lambda n 2 over a p naught multiplied by 1 over alpha. Okay. Where, uh, N2 is uh, 10 power minus 10 centimeter uh, square uh, divided per watt. So, you can basically write it as a 10 power minus 14 meter square per watt. Uh, A corresponds to basically A effective that is the effective mode area in the fiber which we said is uh, 50 micron square ok. Let us consider a lambda of 1.5 micron ok and uh, 1 over alpha is uh, given by uh, it is actually uh, 21.7 kilometers if you do the math ok. So, the question is um, if you have 1 uh, milliwatt of power, how much nonlinear phase do you accumulate? So, if you substitute all these values, what you will find is the nonlinear phase that is accumulated is 0 0.58 pi. Yes. Uh, so, L is far far greater than 1 over alpha is that? That is right. So, beyond that it would not remain nonlinear. So, you can cap it at 1 over alpha. If, if the physical length is greater than 21 kilometers, you can or even if it is comparable to 20, 20 kilometers, you can just uh, approximate that as 1 over alpha. So, so we we say that is that is the phase that is accumulated and is that a problem? Well, maybe because what this phase means is that you, you are expecting your pulse to come at a, a particular slot, bit slot in your digital communication system. By because of this phase the pulse is actually moved over here right the pulse is moved over here. So, part of the energy that is in this slot is actually showing up in the next slot. So, if you are trying to make a decision whether this is a 0 or a 1 you will end up actually making an error in that right. So, there is only so much phase that you can tolerate in fact 
in communications uh, they say okay you can tolerate only up to 0.1 pi so fraction of a uh, pi is all the phase that you can tolerate and you can work backwards and say what should be p naught what should be the power level that that we transmit uh, so that you get only 0.58 pi by the way this is for uh, p naught of uh, 1 milliwatt so you have to be careful about that so in in communications so in, in optical fiber communications the power level in the fiber right p is uh, typically less than uh, 1 milliwatt so you don't try to go beyond a milliwatt uh, in 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 communications because this is one of those nonlinearities that can uh, affect your communications okay but there is one more thing which is um, which is also quite important to consider there's one more nonlinear effect that can uh, affect that can limit your uh, power um, that that you use for optical fiber communications so let's move on to that is there any other question related to this oh by the way so i'm talking about this being a uh, deleterious effect as far as uh, communications is concerned but it could be uh, used as a beneficial effect it could be used to our advantage in certain other applications um, one example of that is in uh, mode locking of a laser there is actually what is known as curl lens mode locking that you can do remember what we want to do in uh, uh, in in mode locking is that we want to lock all the longitudinal modes in phase right that's what we talked about several weeks ago right and uh, to lock all the longitudinal mo modes in in phase one of the things that you'll have to do is uh, you have to essentially limit the time over which the cavity is uh, is 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 open so we we talked about the case in mode locking like if you have a let's say a ring cavity you oops you uh, essentially have a, a, a switch that opens or closes okay what is the rate at which it should open or close to achieve mode locking we talked about opening or closing at the rate of the cavity round trip frequency right so you uh, open and, and, and close at, at the cavity round trip frequency so that you uh, form a pulse and that pulse is actually um, you know circulating within this cavity that is what we talked about when we were discussing mode locking. So you need a mechanism that can open and close at the cavity round trip frequency and that mechanism could be this uh, curl lens right so what do we mean by the uh, curl lens normally let us say you have a, a light wave coming in it is uh, going through a lens and then it is it is focusing at a uh, at a certain point at a certain location right it is it is coming to a focus at a certain location now if this medium uh, if, if the power level that is incident on this medium the intensity of light incident on that medium is very high the refractive index 
that it actually uh, exhibits is different right so if i have a, uh, a a light wave which has an intensity pattern like this that's incident on the medium then what it does is it uh, the medium responds differently okay and so your instead of this being uh, focusing over here it might actually focus here itself okay so this is actually what is called uh, uh, self uh, focusing effect okay and uh, because of that self focusing you know so you you essentially if if i put an aperture over here low intensity pulses will focus over here high intensity will focus over here so that aperture prefers to send high intensity pulses whereas it will block low intensity pulses do you understand that if i put an aperture over here such that it allows only the self focused light self focusing happens only for high intensity so if i have a low intensity pulse that pulse would have actually would would be focusing over there right and uh, there when when it's trying to get there this aperture is blocking it so it's actually providing a loss for low intensity pulses so you have what is called this uh, uh, intensity based loss mechanism okay and uh, this intensity based lock mechanism is through the kerr effect so that's why we call it as a kerr lens effect and uh, you can use this to do mode locking uh that is you can you can uh use it to shape pulses within the cavity and uh, uh so that is actually a very good mechanism for uh mode locking a laser okay it's a very popular mechanism for mode locking a laser so i uh, i'm not doing justice to that i'm just trying to give you some general idea but uh Uh, there is lot more detail in that 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 you may not understand but that's okay i, I just wanted to give you a picture that it could be used for a benish, beneficial purpose also okay um so we said the power is limited to uh, milliwatt levels the other mechanism that limits the optical power that can be um uh sent through an optical fiber is this uh, effect which is called stimulated bruon scattering bruon is actually the name of uh, a scientist who uh, obviously did uh, some very nice experiments to demonstrate this effect so what what really happens in this let's take once again the example of an optical fiber communication system i say i want to i'm i'm communicating between point a to point b right uh, let's say over a distance of uh, 100 kilometers now i have a new locality that's developed beyond point b okay i want to stretch my communication system to reach that location i want to you know put extra fiber and reach that location what would you do if you want to do that if you want to use the same um uh, fiber link but i i have that extra length that i want to support so i i need to at the extra uh, uh, that new location i put a receiver and i need to be uh, able to detect 
a minimum amount of power right so what would you do to reach that location Huh? If you are sitting at the transmitter, you can increase the transmitted power, right? So you would say, okay, uh, I mean, you, you, this is the same as your antenna problem. You are supporting a certain cell with a certain amount of power. Now there is a requirement to expand the cell, so you increase the transmit power, right? That, that's the natural thing you would do in a communication system. But in this case, in an optical fiber communication system, let us say this is the uh, incident power, that is the power that is launched into the fiber. As you increase your uh, incident power, the transmitted power is also going to increase linearly and beyond a certain point, it will just saturate. So, there is, uh, uh, you know, it basically says that I cannot go beyond a certain power level, right. I, I, even if I put more power, it is not going through, it is like hitting a wall. I am not able to increase the uh, transmitted power. Why is this happening? Well, this is happening because if you look at, so this is on the uh, transmitted power. But if you look at the back reflected power, the back reflected power would be like this. So, this is my uh, reflected power. So, whatever I throw into the fiber beyond a certain power level, it is just coming back to me. It is all back reflected and that obviously does not help in a communication system, right? You are trying to send information from one end to another, but uh, beyond a certain power level, that, that, that information is just coming back to you. It is not going through to the other end, okay? So, what is happening in this sort of case? What, what actually provides this uh, threshold? And I, I would say that, uh, I'll just give you a feel for this. This threshold is in the order of about uh, 5 uh, milliwatts, around about 5 milliwatts in a regular single mode uh, fiber, okay. So, what exactly is happening? Well, to understand this, you need to look at what is happening when light actually propagates through a medium. In this case, let us say it is a fused silica glass medium in that corresponds to an optical fiber. You are sending an uh, electromagnetic wave into this uh, medium, let us say at uh, frequency nu naught, okay. Now, within this uh, medium, you would actually find uh, that it is consisting of uh, atoms and molecules and uh, uh, if it is a fused silica medium, it is highly amorphous in nature. So, you have all these atoms that are sitting around and then there are uh, bonds between them, right. So, it is a network, it is a glass uh, network, right. And that network is not at room temperature. It is not uh, static, I mean you look at a fiber and it says it is a piece of solid and that is all static, right. But if you look at the microscopic picture, all these atoms are all moving around their uh, uh, mean positions. So, there are some uh, vibrations that are, that, that, that entire network is getting agitated. Okay. And uh, these vibrations are uh, referred to as acoustic phonons. This is like even at room temperature, there is some there are some sound waves that are generated within that 
uh, optical fiber. It so happens that this these sound waves are now backscattering part of the light. Okay, your light is getting scattered by these acoustic phonons. Okay, and so now part of that light, I mean, it's scattered in all all different all directions, right? But part of that light is captured by the fiber and it's going back, and that part of that light will now interact with the incoming light right so you, you the fields of uh, of the incident light and the uh, field of the back reflected light they interact with each other and they actually generate a periodic change in the refractive index okay so that periodic change is uh, is is corresponding to so your um, that that is through your uh, uh, chi three that's actually through the imaginary part of your chi three e total square that e total is the uh, incident electric field and the scattered electric field the, the, uh, corresponding to that there will be uh, a total electric field and that electric field will essentially cause a change in the response of the medium change in the refractive index of the medium and uh, it will give you this periodic thing that periodic grating now will reflect this even more strongly so that you you go back with a frequency that is given by nu naught minus nu b a uh, nu b is uh, referred to as your uh, bruon frequency okay and then this entire effect is is essentially uh, called bruon scattering um so what are we talking about we are talking about light getting scattered by sound waves inside this medium okay these are naturally occurring sound waves inside this medium and because of that you have a, a downshift in the frequency why is a downshift in the frequency well you can say that since your light wave is propagating from left to right right your your, your sound waves are uh, you know also uh, uh, you know going in that direction but it cannot it cannot move at the speed of light it can move only at the speed of sound okay so you can say that if you are sending a pulse of light that pulse actually travels from left to right and correspondingly there is a scattering happening and there is a interference pattern that interference pattern also moves from left to right in the same direction as your light wave okay so what happens when you reflect off a moving object so you you you, you have a sound wave let's say well I'm, we are talking about a light wave but i'm just giving you an analogy if you have a sound wave echoing from a moving object what happens doppler, doppler shift right and if it's if it's uh, uh, if it's a object that's moving away it's a downshift in frequency if it's coming towards you it's a upshift in frequency so that's the kind of frequency shift we get because this entire uh, interaction is is moving uh, from left to right it's actually cor corresponding to a downshift in the frequency and uh, that downshift can be quantified by considering 
you know what is happening in terms of the k vectors right so we have an incident k vector like this let's call this this the pump uh, k vector pump is basically the incident uh, k vector and then what you have is k s coming in the uh, reverse direction this is actually what is called uh, uh, th that is the Bruin scattered uh, uh, wave and uh, it is also you know the difference between the two is given by the acoustic wave vector. So, I can write an equation saying that k p minus k s is uh, given by k a. So, I have a scattered wave due to this acoustic wave right that is that is uh, in, in that is propagating the material. Now, um, if I say that the magnitude of k p is approximately equal to the magnitude of k s and since it is actually k s is in the opposite direction. So, you can write this as 2 times magnitude of k p is equal to the magnitude of k a right because what we are saying is this uh, both of these the the incident wave as well as the scattered wave correspond to uh, the wavelength of light whereas k a corresponds to the wavelength of uh, sound wave sound waves have a much longer wavelength compared to light wavelength right and and because of that k which is 2 pi over lambda k s is much greater than k a right. So, you can you can write this as um, uh, k s is almost equal to k p and in which case you can say 2 times k p equals to k a and uh, 2 times k p is nothing but 2 pi over lambda p lambda p is the wavelength corresponding to the uh, incident wave multiplied by n effective right is the effective refractive index that the wave is seeing in the fiber this equals um, your angular frequency which is 2 pi uh, nu b right that uh, nu b is the uh, frequency of the acoustic wave uh, divided by v a where v a is the velocity. Uh, so, you can write this as 2 pi over lambda where lambda corresponds to the wavelength of acoustic wave and that wavelength is V a divided by nu b right. So, uh, of course, you can say in this 2 pi 2 pi cancels and uh, so, what you ca what you have is nu b is given by um, 2 times n effective multiplied by V a divided by uh, lambda p. Okay. So, this is essentially the downshift in the frequency that you that you get to see. Okay. So, uh, if if you put some numbers to this n effective let us say is approximately 1.5 right and uh, V a is the sound of uh, I mean is the velocity of sound in uh, uh, in fused silica which is uh, about 6 uh, kilometers per second and uh, lambda p let us consider that to be uh, 1.5 microns right 
if you substitute all of this you just get nu b is 12 gigahertz ok. So, your scattered frequency is uh, 12 gigahertz downshifted from the light frequency ok. This is what you see in, uh, uh, in silica fibers. But, but so that is the level of detail um, that, that may not be so interesting to some people. What is important to understand is that you have this effect where beyond a certain power level that you put into the fiber, right? You, you start having this Bruin scattering which means that light is actually getting backscattered. Okay, it is not going forward. Now, so that is actually very bad for communications, right? It is really bad for communications, but there is actually uh, a finer point which uh, maybe gives us some hope. That, that finer detail is that this is the threshold if your source is uh, highly coherent ok. What do I mean by that? If my source is highly coherent that means it is a monochromatic source right. It, it has only one color. If it has one color then I have a uh, very specific uh, wave pattern like this. And if I have a very specific wave pattern then uh, my interference fringes are very strong. Okay. If you do not have that coherence, if you say my um, light wave is relatively incoherent, it has got multiple frequencies to it then you do not have a very specific wave pattern, the wave is sort of like spread out and correspondingly when you are doing that interference, what do you, what do you get as interference for incoherent light? The fringes just wash out, you cannot, you do not have this high visibility fringes. So, for incoherent light stimulated scattering, this Bruin scattering is not, uh, is not a problem. And why am I calling it stimulated Bruin scattering? Because Bruin scattering happens at any power level. When light actually goes through the medium, it gets scattered by these acoustic phonons in the medium. Okay? But only beyond a certain power level, the scattered light is actually interacting with the incoming light and creating a grating which really enhances the backscattered light. So, only beyond uh, you know this sort of power level you have that backscattering happening in a very strong manner ok. And in, in that case it is actually stimulated that backscattering is stimulated by your regular spontaneous scattering ok. The, so, that is why it is called stimulated Brouhan scattering, but nevertheless it is, it is, uh, this is a threshold if it is highly coherent, if, but, but you need coherence in communications, why? Narrower the line width, less will be the dispersion that you incur in your optical fiber communication system. So, so, th that is why you try to go for a highly coherent laser like a distributed feedback laser, but if you use distributed feedback laser you better not go you know beyond milliwatt of power level because beyond that you start seeing effect of stimulated Brouhan scattering. It does not help to keep increasing the power because you will you will end up having this uh, issue of uh, stimulated Bruin scattering ok. But uh, 
I teach this other course, optical sensors in parallel. I'm going to go to a lecture in 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 an hour from now, and I'm going to tell them stimulated Bruin scattering is great. Why? Because for sensing, it's it's actually a wonderful opportunity. Um, primarily because of the fact that when you look at this V A, this velocity of acoustic wave, that velocity is dependent on the density of the medium okay and then that density changes whenever you are subjecting the fiber to strain or temperature okay so what does that mean in a long section of fiber if i have a particular section where i have strain or temperature in that section the velocity of the acoustic wave is changing which means that the frequency that's backscattered from that particular section is changing so if i am tracking this frequency around 12 gigahertz i can tell how much is the strain or temperature at that particular point so it's 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 bad for communication but it could be very good for uh, for sensing applications okay Okay, let me stop here.